Welcome into the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. This week, we are going to discuss the current state of the patriarchal crime family, and I'm going to bring in, you know, we always go right to the source here uh, at the OG Pod, and Tim White from WPRI uh, in Rhode Island is the epitome of uh, a mob expert, a mobologist. He, to me, is the preeminent um voice and uh, reporter on uh, New England patriarchal activity. Uh, Tim, thank you for joining me. Scott, I love being on. Thanks for having me. So, um, you know, I'm excited to, we've done a couple episodes mm -hmm. this past year uh, talking about Providence, a uh, little bit of Boston, but not with an expert like yourself. So I uh, kind of want to just do patriarchal family 2023 headed to, to 2024. Um, there's probably been more activity in Providence the last year or two than the previous handful of years. Um, we know, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but we know that the seat of power, which had been in Providence for a long time, um, has moved over the last decade plus to, to Boston. Is that, would you say that's accurate? Yeah, I would say it actually, um, the seat of power moved to Boston, I would say approximately 2009. I mean, the last time Rhode Island had a true boss was uh, Luigi Baby Shacks Minacchio, who essentially stepped down from the position in 2009 when he learned that the, fe uh, the feds were on him. Um, and he was right because, uh, you know, what had happened in 2009 is he was walking out of a Federal Hill restaurant, uh, enjoying, I believe, uh, Italian wedding soup, if I recall correctly. And uh, he had just received a protection payment from a strip club in the area. It, a runner had given it to him. But what he didn't know until the indictment came out was they were marked bills by the by the FBI. And when he walked out of uh, the restaurant, two, he was approached by two FBI agents, Joe Degnan and Jeff Cady, uh, who had a what's called a body warrant. And they served the body warrant on them and, and removed the money. And uh, they were able to establish uh, that protection payment or that uh, level of extortion. Um, but they, he wasn't charged, uh, as you know, Scott, until 2011. Two along, years later. Yeah. It, along with um, eight other defendants, uh, both maid and associates, uh, in a in a wide-ranging uh, shakedown scheme of a uh, primarily of adult entertainment spots in, in, in Rhode Island. That was part of a, a broader, I think one of the reasons for the delay, a little speculation on my part, but one of the reasons for the delay at the time was because there was a national department of justice push. Um, it, there was a, a sweep in, in New York. There was a sweep in Philly. There were sweeps all over the country at that time. And new England was a, was one of the big ones, uh, so I think they were coordinating the timing on that. So they probably delayed New England a little bit, is my guess at the time. Anyway, but he saw it coming. Louis saw it coming. So he stepped down. And that's when there was a couple of sort of acting street bosses up in Boston um, until Carmen D'Annunzio uh, got out of prison. And according to, um, you know, police affidavits that I read and intelligence reports, uh, he is identified currently as the boss of the Patriarca crime family. By the way, it always fascinates me that, you know, we still call it the Patriarca crime family here in Rhode Island, uh, in New England, I should say, um, even though, you know, Junior Patriarca, who's still alive, he ceded that power, I think back in 1989 or, or, or whatever mm -hmm. it might've been because of an indictment. And sometimes crime families, they'll change their names, but it really speaks to the legacy of Raymond L.S. Patriarca, yeah. Lesso Jr. Um, uh, that, that we still call it the patriarchic crime family. So it's always fascinating to me. So talk about Louie for a little bit. Um, one of the more tenured, uh, LCN members, uh, in the country, he's in his nineties now, uh, hasn't yeah. been boss, as you said, since uh, 2009, but, uh, led the, uh, patriarchal clan from mid nineties when, um, Cadillac Frank got locked up, uh, till the late 2000 and, uh, late 2000s, stabilized the family uh, to a degree. I know he's, from my research and talking to people, a bit of a lightning rod 
uh, people either have mad respect for him or bitterly dislike him. Um, where, where do you put him um, when you're talking about, you know, the pantheon uh, of the underworld in, in Providence? Where does he fit in? Well, I never like to glamorize organized crime. Um, and I, I think there's uh, too much of the media, meaning the media is a, it's a big umbrella. Yep. Right. A media includes journalists like myself, but it also includes Hollywood. And uh, and I think LCN tends to be glamorized in that. But uh, glamorized it's, romantic, it's definitely romanticized. It is romanticized. And to a fault, it's revisionist history. Yep. Um, so I just like to put that disclaimer uh, yes. in front before I say, look, he is uh, an old school legendary mob boss in the patriarchal crime family that. Um, you know, he is, as you say, he's in his 90s. He's 96 years old, uh, recently spotted on Federal Hill. Um, one of someone on my staff saw him, uh, I think, two months ago. You know, he looks great. He's a health nut. I think you probably talked about on this podcast quite a bit. Um, and that has paid off for him because we should all be so lucky to be uh, 96 years old. And you're right. He is a polarizing figure within the world of organized crime in New England. But I don't think that's unusual for a mob boss. I think it's like anything else. Um, you know, there are factions within a crime family that uh, certain factions are favored when this boss is in power and other factions are favored when that boss is in power. And look, Menachio had strong ties to Salemi when Menachio was under boss and um, he he was elevated uh, to boss post Salemi, as, as, you, as you pointed out. I think some of the complaints that you heard were from those factions that felt like they weren't getting the juice that uh, they deserved, that they weren't able to uh, make the money, that it's always about money, isn't it? That money and power. And, and, with, and, and he is a guy, when we're talking about Baby Shacks, who very polished, uh, oh, yeah. carried himself more like a banker than a mob boss, uh, in, in, at least publicly. And he was a bottom line guy. He was a brass tax guy. To, to what you're saying about what I've heard, I heard the complaints were that he was incredibly greedy and he, he didn't want to share. He, he wanted to eat off other people's plates. Well, you know, yes. Um, I think that was part of the, again, that's all part of money that uh, right. that's what I'm saying. The, yeah. the complaints about him. That's true. But look, he was one of a kind. I mean, he spoke multiple language. He was on the run for years, believed to have been hiding out in places like Chamonix, France, uh, when he was wanted for murder. He's an, uh, I don't know if he still is, quite frankly, but he was an avid skier uh, and like the type of skiing where you jump out of helicopters, <laughs> right. you know, Stream like, yeah, yeah. Like real, you know, interesting, interesting guy. And I've talked to him a couple of times. He's a true old school wise guy who will never give me anything of substance. But um, he's never I'll, been married, has he? No, nope, never been married. And he was, I mean, that's part of the legend. The legacy of baby shacks that he used to shack up with a lot of people. That's so some people theorize that's where he got that, that nickname from is that he was quite the good looking guy, quite the ladies man, um, all of that. So real, like I going back to what I said before, real old school guy. Um, and you know, I think your legacy as you, you separate yourself from what you were just talking about and the, the complaints that he received when he was in power, you know, as time moves on, I mean, he it's been 14 years since he's been the mob boss. Sort of that that narrative is going to evolve mm -hmm. and he will become more and more of a legend because he represents um, bygone he, era. It really does. I think that's a good word, a good phrase for it. So um, but he's he's still around. I mean, a lot of the guys that are still around made members and, and some associates, um, you know, they're. Well, they look a lot like our U.S. Senate, right? I mean, they're yeah. older, <laughs> and they could probably run for for Congress. But. I think that the the contrast that I was making, and I, I want to get your take on this, was if we're talking about Providence, at least we could talk about Boston too. But if we're talking about Providence, um, when you talk about a guy like Maddie, uh, Ma Maddie Googly Maddie, mm -hmm. um, I don't feel like he's polarizing. I, I haven't heard many people say a negative word about Maddie. Uh, everyone that I've spoken to, at least in my research, uh, from multiple crime families, um, Maddie seems to be more um, universally well liked and, okay. and respected. Okay, but I guess the only difference is Maddie is 
he is still uh, Matty Gugliametti is still, still active. active. He's yeah. active. He's right. a capo in the crime family. There's a case, uh, Scott, that that I'm following very closely here, a, a narcotics case in, yes. involving somebody with uh, who the Rhode Island State Police and the Attorney General's office allege has strong ties to mm-hmm. Matty Gugliametti and that clan. We've um, talked about him on this podcast, Dino uh, Gometti. Dino Gometti, um, yeah. right? And so the, the, that that whole that whole faction. So based on, and I, you know, I always want to point out to your viewers and your listeners that all of this stuff is sort of a lagging indicator with folks like me. There are things that I won't talk about because I've just heard rumors and I haven't. Mm-hmm. An old saying in journalism, Scott, is if your mother says she loves you, check it out. Check it out, right? Yeah. So I've learned that the hard way a couple times. Well, right. You, you yeah. don't want to make a mistake because you're going to hear about it, especially in the type of reporting that we yes. do. <laughs> um, so a lot of stuff I've heard, like I've heard the books were open for a few people. Not yeah. going to name those people on the show because I haven't independently uh, verified that. Right. So it's what I do talk about tends to be a lagging indicator of uh, through uh, uh, affidavits to support a search warrant, affidavits to support an right. arrest warrant. And the indications are, just to wrap this up, you know, Maddie Gugliametti is uh, still a capo, longtime capo in the Patriarca crime family uh, with ties back to the old man, Raymond L.S. Patriarca, uh, well-respected, obviously, in, in that world, for what it's worth. Um, and that Eddie Lado, um, who was a capo, is the underboss of the Patriarca crime family. And I'm happy to talk more about Eddie if you yeah. want, uh, Scott. But that, that has been commonly, just going back to how you began our segment, um, when the boss is in Boston, the underboss traditionally is in Providence, vice, vice right. versa. When the boss is here, the underboss, like think an, the, the Angelos up in Boston, when Raymond L.S. Patriarca was in power, the Angelo, uh, Gennaro Angelo was the underboss. When Salemi was in power, Louis Minacchio was the underboss down here. So it ping pongs between mm-hmm. the two. And of course, the the whole family has very strong ties to the Genovese crime family of the five families in in New York. That's generally traditionally who they've quote unquote answered to. Um, before we jump into Eddie, and sure. I want to talk about Eddie, but um, I, I'd like to get your comment if you're willing to comment. And, and we don't have to talk about names of people that uh, you know specifics. But I, like you, I've heard there uh, have been. Um, I've heard at least two uh, making ceremonies in the last year or two um, related to guys in Providence. Uh, I know that they're making guys in Boston as well, but I heard, and I've, I got mixed reaction um, when I put this out there to um, Steve O'Donnell, who who's a, just a, another superstar in the world of mobology. Um, I had heard that, uh, Maddie and Eddie were allowed to make these guys themselves and they, they did not need to take them up to Boston um, like normal protocol. When Maddie got made, for instance, in 19, I think it was 77 or 78, he had to go to the North End. Uh, I think a group of seven or eight guys from Providence traveled to the North End that day, including uh, Raymond Jr., uh, and got made in Boston. I had heard that this was these were ceremonies that were conducted in Providence by Providence guys. Well, I guess you, so. Um, I've heard a lot of things. You're very good at what you do. I read you. So, um, you know, I think that you're pl- a plugged in person. I will not comment on okay. what you just talked about just for what I had said earlier. But the only thing I push back at is um, the North End is obviously central to Mm -hmm. uh, the LCN in New England, as is Federal Hill. What matters more than geography is who the boss is and all of that. You have to remember one of the most famous induction ceremonies caught on tape by the FBI, uh, presided over by then boss Raymond Jr. Patriarca, happened happened not in the North End, happened Mm -hmm. not on Federal Hill. It happened in in a suburb of Medford, Massachusetts, uh, I've been to the neighborhood. It's like any working class blue tiny collar. House, tiny house. Yeah, it's just a small colonial, you know, that happened to be three doors down from an FBI agent. So they were able to physically, it's 1989 now, yeah. physically run a wire uh, from one house to the other so they could plant a microphone in there. But anyway, that, that's a 
a great story. It's legendary. You've talked about it on your podcast before, but um, my point being is it has a lot to do, less to do with geography, I would say, Scott, and more to do with the people that are presiding over over that ceremony. But, but to your point, let's say um, what you talked about is true. That would be significant. It's, it's just so to be clear, and Steve O'Donnell, uh, while we had him on here, he said he didn't believe that. He he said if if uh, they were making guys in Providence, uh, they would have had to be made. Uh, I don't know if he said in Massachusetts, but made by the boss. And since Maddie and Eddie aren't considered bosses, uh, he doesn't believe that Providence could have conducted its own ceremony. So yeah, just it, what, you know, specifics sometimes get conflated and lost through you know sources of the telephone game and so forth. So I could be wrong. Yeah, look, traditionally, the boss makes uh, gives people their button, um, mm -hmm. and so it would be significant if that happened. But I guess what I was driving at is what that does do is sort of reinforce what my reporting has shown, which is the family has relied more and more on associates of the crime family and less so on, on made members. But that doesn't mean they're not opening the books uh, here and there. My intelligence is that is, that is happening. Um, you know, how it's go, how they go yeah. about it and things like that, you know, that is, some work still needs to be done there. And look, I think we might learn more potentially uh, if this Gilmet case goes to trial, which it might not, could settle well, out. Most criminal cases do. We some more uh, more light could be shed on on all. Well, of let's it. also parse that for a second, though, because sure. you have the current case that uh, Dino Gomet faces, which is a state case, um, and then you have a federal investigation uh, that theoretically could bring another case. Is that correct? I mean, the the case that he's facing now is related to like anti anxiety pills. Um, yeah, the, uh, I'm against Gilmet. I'm only familiar with a, a, a state case right now. I'm right. unfamiliar with a, he, he does not, he doesn't any, have a federal case. He doesn't have any he, federal charges. I've heard that he's being investigated along with Maddie Google and Medi, um, in, well, in, in federal uh, uh, narcotics uh, investigation. Well, let's, let's be, let's be clear. I mean, um, I think first of all, a lot of these guys all work, um, well, I say these guys, uh, law enforcement guys, will work together mm -hmm. on task forces. So, for instance, we we talk about the 2011 case that brought down Louis Minocchio et al. Uh, Eddie Leto was there. Uh, we later learned that Bobby DeLuca Capo was wearing a wire for the FBI, all of that. But also working on that case were members of the state police. State police yeah. But so cases, whether it's the feds investigating them or the state, Cases will be transferred over to the Department of Justice. Why? Because the federal statutes that can be applied in some of these cases, particularly if it's a narcotics case, as you allude to, are much stronger. And uh, so you'll still have state investigators working on you, members of the intelligence unit of the mm -hmm. Rhode Island State Police working with FBI, DEA, and it can be transferred uh, some of the stuff can be kicked over to, you know, federal court in, in Providence or federal court in Boston, right. depending on, on what it is. Just so pe for people that are, you know, either Midwesterners or West Coasters, I, I think it's important to note that in on the East Coast, particularly New England, uh, you have the state police still are very active in organized crime investigations. That's not the case anymore in, in Michigan, Illinois. You know, the state police don't deal with the mob guys. It's only a, a federal beat, if you will. Um, but in, in Rhode Island, in Massachusetts, uh, the state police are, are very um, active investigating. 100%. And organized crime means a lot. Organized right. crime doesn't mean always capital Mafia. M Mafia right. or La Cosa Nostra traditionally. Right. It does. We actually reported on a, a recent case a state police brought. It was a fascinating case against a... Uh, we have. Mar recre recreational marijuana is legalized here in Rhode Island. There was a cultivator that had ties to a mob associate um, here. The state shut them down. It was a state police investigation. It ended up that that person had ties to the House Speaker's office. Um, you know, undercover. So we're talking about Scarface Jenkins, who's a associate uh, 
acted as muscle over the years for Eddie and Louis. Yeah, he was um, a silent partner, according to the state right. police, in a marijuana grow operation, which by law he couldn't be. If you have a criminal record, you can't you can't hold a um, a grow license. That's right, and so and furthermore, the business failed to disclose him as an owner for obvious reasons, and and that was a violation of of cannabis regulations here. So anyway, that was a state investigation. That was not. Um, a federal investigation. So you're right uh, that law enforcement, state, um, not local really, but state are involved in those types of things. But that includes, like I said, organized crime also includes the Hells Angels. Very mm -hmm. active investigations here between uh, on the Hells Angels, as well as the outlaws and the, and the sub, pagans yeah. and the pagans, the sub biker affiliates. We have an ongoing uh, beef, I, I, you know, the, no surprise between the Hells Angels yeah. and the Outlaws here. We we had a murder not too long ago in uh, a city the north of Providence called Pawtucket um, that uh, allegedly involves the Hells Angels. That is a very active investigation right now. I wouldn't be surprised if we hear uh, some developments in all of that. But my understanding is that is a very active state investigation. So uh, you don't you see them working together a lot, and they like to talk about. Law enforcement likes to talk about these task forces and how they all work together. But let's be real. Uh, each agency wants to make the big arrest. Uh, you know, it is competitive in that way. And, and state police are still active in that game, as you point out, right. And rightly so, both in Rhode Island and in Massachusetts, very robust intelligence operations there. So well, let's get into Eddie Leto for a sure. little bit. Another guy like Maddie and Louie, you know, old school, old timer, OG, um, has, it seems like he's been around forever. I love those photos of him. I know that you uh, you did you did a great. Uh, you can probably still find it online for people that are watching this. But Tim did a about ten years ago. Tim, uh, Tim did a great uh, series on the current state of um, the mafia in in Rhode Island at that point. And they have you guys kind of have like an interactive graphic on the website where you could click on guys and you could see pictures of them from the past. Yes. And you got pictures of Eddie back in the 70s with like his like white man, Italian Afro. <laughs> uh, some great photos. Yeah. Eddie Leto, um, been a made guy for, you know, four decades now, uh, was a long time capo. He got that in that 2011 case you and I have talked about throughout this segment. Um, he got the stiffest prison term in that nine years. Seven, eight, seven, eight years. I think it was nine years. Uh, right. I have to look. I actually have it here. I'll look. But um, anyway, by far the even and he was a capo at the time. So he got more time than Louis Minocchio did. And that's because he has such a lengthy criminal history. Right. And when they, they do the the sentencing guideline recommendations to the federal judge, his number was quite high. Um, so anyway, he let, let me just real quick, Tim. Yeah, I, I want to correct something that I said in a previous episode. Um and I'm I'm my biggest, I'm my worst critic or my my toughest critic. Uh, I think in a previous episode I had said that uh, little Eddie had uh, come up in the crew of uh, Eddie Romano uh, Mulligan. And that's incorrect. Uh, he was a he was a Rudy uh, uh, Scar guy. That's what my understanding is. Right. Yeah, and that he came up under Rudy. Come up, he came up under Rudy. Right. Uh, yeah, not Romano. Um, right. So, so I just wanted to clear that. For just for the people that have, that remember me saying that, I was uh, I always want to correct the record, and then I'll give I'll give the floor back to Tim. <laughs> so, in but either way, I mean, we're, you, we're, even if well, you, Bobby DeLuca came up uh, came up under Eddie Romano, I was confusing them. Okay, and DeLuca also had very strong ties, you know, to the Salemi faction yes, right. in in Massachusetts, right. but. Um, yeah, so I was right. Eddie got 108 months, which if you, if you divide that by 12 is nine years. Um, and the longest sentence there, he did that time uh, and got out whatever it was in 2017, 18. 18 it was yeah. it, okay, 18, 19. He went to a halfway house in Pawtucket. Um, and then sometime thereafter, uh, he was, according to a state police affidavit in that that cannabis. Um, that was It was from the cannabis case. Yep, it's it, actually I was, I also. Couldn't rem I couldn't remember if it came from that or from the still met. So you'll have some of the same intel is used in these affidavits in multiple cases, and uh, you had uh, that in the cannabis case, and you also had it in the um, in the Gilmet case. He's mentioned it in there as well, but he was 
he was named underboss. Now, he's not, relatively speaking, he's not all that old. He's 76 years old. Um, you know, when he's, we're talking he's pretty, about... He's pretty buff. He's, I mean, he looks sto like, he's stocky. He's a stocky like he looked, guy. Like, I wouldn't... Even at 76 years old, I feel like he could do some damage in a street fight. <laughs> he probably could. Right. But, uh, but he's been sick. Uh, is our understanding, and you know, we're obviously uh, all watching I've heard that, I've heard that as well. Yeah, he, we well. understand he's not he's not doing great. Um, hope he does well. Um, but you know, so obviously, that's sort of the buzz on the street and within the law enforcement community that that we talk to. And if something were to happen to him, if uh, he were to continue to get ill, then you know, the question is, does does uh, that elevate Maddie Gugliametti? Um, in any way, again, this is the stuff that um, just in talking to folks that monitor this is, mm -hmm. is what they're watching and in, in, in what it all means. But I hey, look, they are limping along. Uh, the Patriarca crime family is limping along in New England, as many crime families are across the country. So uh, it, there aren't a lot of made members uh, to speak of anyway. Um, and the factions have grown smaller and smaller. But we are seeing evidence that they're still active uh, out there, and that Eddie is a is a, according to the state police, a key player. I don't Can you talk about his personality and and what, how people view him and what he kind of is known for? Eddie is a very mild mannered guy, um, and uh, I've interacted with him just a handful of times. Uh, you know, actually, much of my career here. Uh, he's been in prison, um, but, you know, I interacted with him as he came out of federal court, uh, you know, particularly leading up to the 2011 stuff. And he had multiple cases going on, including uh, facing state charges here. He actually had to come from a federal prison to state. So the few times I've interacted with him, kind of a lot, like I said about Louis. I mean, he's old school uh, made guy who was very cordial, very polite acknowledged you didn't wasn't rude to you but he didn't tell you anything <laughs> coming out of court um and i i think you know he's um he's a respected guy uh in in the circles in in rhode island because he's been around uh, for so long and he's also look in that world uh he, there's a almost like a badge of honor for how much t time he served in prison because he didn't cut any deals. You contrast that with a, someone like Bobby DeLuca, who, as you've talked about, has denounced the mob. As we referenced earlier in the segment, he, he flipped wore, twice. He flipped twice. He did. And he wore a wire. By the way, Eddie Leto was caught on that wire. And one of my favorite um, exchanges Eddie had with Bobby. And at the time, you know, I heard it was Bobby DeLuca that wore the wire, but. Uh, it wasn't revealed until later, until actually uh, the Salemi trial, is that Eddie was going to Boston to visit Anthony D'Annunzio, who was the street boss, the acting yeah. boss at the time. And he was complaining to Bobby about basically the pitfalls of being an upper echelon made guy, <laughs> saying, every time I leave my effing house, you know, there's, there's someone watching me, meaning a fed or right. a member of the state police and they're following me. And, and, and Denunzio was like complaining to him that he got followed. And he's like, what do you mean they're following me? You're the friggin' boss, you know, kind of a yeah. thing. So uh, just one of my more, it's w one of my favorite exchanges from, from that case was between uh, was between Eddie and Bobby. So uh, I just want to state something that I've heard. Uh, and, and I know I'm kind of going out of order, but we'll eventually make it back to Boston. But I've heard that uh, as of right now, uh, Car Carmen D'Annunzio is the boss officially, but that Anthony, um, his brother, and Spucky Spagnolo are basically running the day-to-day. -day. I don't know what exactly the, the um, position, the official positions are. Um, I've heard that Anthony is considered acting boss. Um, as Spucky is some type of advisor slash street boss, all you know, guys that have been around for a long time. The Denunzios got their button from Louis back in the nineties. Um, uh, Spucky got his button from, I believe, the Angelos or or or, or Raymond. Uh, mm. He got his button 
in the late seventies, early eighties, maybe. Yeah. You know um, more about that than I do. I, yeah. Yeah. So, um, have you heard anything other than the fact that, and then another thing I want to correct the record for, <laughs> I got a lot of, I got a lot of uh, grief for this and uh, rightfully so, uh, the Denunzio guys are no longer at the Gemini Social Club uh, in the North End. They've moved out of there. Uh, I know I, I said it about five or six months ago. I, I referred to them as the, the Gemini Social Club guys, and people were like, "Oh, they haven't been there in a year and a half." And again, I should have, you know, I should have double checked. I know they're they're spending their time um, in Revere and and uh, Medford, and you know, not as much in their old uh, North End uh, stomping grounds. I mean, talk about granular level I know, but people corrections lose their, that people you're lose their mind over. Oh this yeah, like and that. it makes. I mean, that's you know, uh, part of an identity or a world or or any of that. It's all uh, it's it's all important to certain yeah. to certain sections. And honestly, like I, I, most of my reporting is down here, not up in Boston. Right. I'm not saying I'm not asking you to speak on that. I'm just speaking to the people that consume me that remember me saying that and got got in my comments section and was very uh, and they should have they should have corrected me. I just wanted to state for the record again, just like I misspoke on uh, Eddie Lato's mentor. Um, I misspoke on the fact that the denunzios are still hanging out. At well, the I mean, the thing about what you, the thing about what you do, which is so exhausting to me, uh, you know, and I obviously track your stuff. You are keeping your you're trying to keep your yeah. finger on the pulse of multiple, right, multiple crime families, families yeah. across the country. Right. My job is easy in comparison. I, I just have to follow the you know what I mean. I cover a lot in Rhode Island. I I cover politics. I moderate gubernatorial and, and right. congressional debates. I do so. Organ. I'm not solely an organized crime reporter, but obviously it's uh, something that the the government is still tracking here. They're spending money on it. I'm going to continue to track it if if, uh, if that's something that they prioritize uh, here. So anyway, my point is, uh, you know, if you miss the little granular details hey, here no. and there, uh, cut yourself a break. Because, Thank you. <laughs> I try to, but then yeah, I, that's uh, unbelievable. But to your point, you asked me about the Denunzio brothers and Spucky. Um, I'm just going to lean into uh, the reporting I've done to, and just say that uh, law enforcement agencies have identified Carmen Denunzio as the boss. To your point of um, you know who's pulling the levers and all that, I think really what that means is and is true is you know the Denunzios themselves are the epicenter of yes. power uh, for the according to intelligence to, uh, for the New England uh, crime family. And what that looks like on the ground, again, uh, lagging indicator. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see how that plays out. I've also heard that uh, Carmen's dropped about 150 pounds. Oh, wow. He he's, uh, was told by his doctor, he was 400 pounds. I mean, he's that's how big he was. He was told by the doctor if he did not get down to 300 to 275-ish, uh, and I don't know if he's there yet. Uh, he might have been over 400, but uh, that day he was gonna he was gonna die. His heart was just gonna give out on him. I mean, yeah. If, you, if, if you're uh, you know your listeners Google his name Carmen, and it's either goes by Cheese Man or, or the Big, Big Cheese, Cheese yeah. Denunzio, um, and you do an image search for him, usually what comes up is his arraignment up in uh, Suffolk County, up in Boston, uh, and so it wasn't federal court. Federal court, no cameras are allowed inside. It was state, or in that case, county court. And so there's that's usually the image that comes up. And, and you can see if he has dropped 150 pounds, that'll be a noticeable difference from yeah. what you'll see in that image. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about a case that hasn't been brought. Um, and I'm being told it's not going to be brought. Uh, you know, as uh Cadillac Frank and Bobby DeLuca were pulled out of witness protection in 2016. If you've consumed this podcast, we've talked, we've done multiple episodes on the Stevie DeSaro slain uh, and the trial. Uh, Cadillac Frank uh, and Bobby DeLuca were both in witness protection. And, and when DeSaro's body got dug up uh, off of Branch Avenue in Providence, spring of 16, both charged. Uh, DeLuca flips for the second time is the star witness against 
Cadillac Frank within the cooperation DeLuca cops to the 1992 Kevin Hanrahan gangland slain, which That's is one right. of the one of the more notorious New England uh, mob homicides, you know, in, in history. Uh, September 18th, 1992 on Federal Hill, uh, leaving uh, the Arch Steakhouse. Yep. Um, according to Bobby DeLuca, Baby Shacks, Eddie Lato, uh, and a deceased uh, former conciliary, Rocco Argenti, uh, were central in that homicide. Uh, I know there have been grand juries that have been convened, no charges, and I'm being told there probably won't be. Um, do you have any? Uh, yeah, I'm thoughts? willing to talk a little bit further about that. Yeah. Uh, 100% right, Scott. Um, I, I don't think anyone should be holding their breath for charges on that one. They would have happened by now. Um, my understanding is Bobby DeLuca, as you sort of laid the groundwork, was prepared to testify that Eddie Leto was one of the two men, along with Rocco, that approached Kevin Hanrahan that night. Um, of the two men who pulled the trigger, that would have come out in trial, according to Bobby DeLuca. But let's just take a step back and analyze why they didn't press any charges in that case. Yeah. And I think it is just safe to say they didn't have much, they meaning the government, beyond Bobby DeLuca. Bobby DeLuca, and they didn't feel like DeLuca by himself on the witness stand was a strong enough witness and had the veracity and the ability to overcome a tough cross-examination. And why? And why? Because he was convicted of perjury Yeah. Um, up, up in Boston. Now, Boston put him on the stand. He was one of the star witnesses against Cadillac Frank Salemi. But you had said, other people. You had his had brother. Other... You had... Um, right. So Joe DeLuca Stevie takes Fleming. the stand, who just died this year. Right. Um, Stephen the Rifleman, Flemmy. Now, all of these characters on their own are flawed, to put it politely, in terms of how a jury will perceive them. But when you put them all together and they're all telling the same story and corroborating the same story, and I know people listening to this are be like, well, of course they're telling the same story because they were coached and blah, blah, blah. But you have to understand the jury's perception of, of the facts. Um, and you're able to piece it all together that way. In the Hanrahan case, you don't have all that. The, the net is pretty narrow. Um, and you really just had the word, primarily it landed on Bobby DeLuca. And to bring a case like that one, you know, prosecutors really like to only bring cases they know they're going to win or they're going to, a plea deal is going to get cop to, which is like 90 something percent of criminal cases. And they, they just, I don't think felt like they had it. You had a new attorney general who came in, Peter Nerona, who took over for uh, a predecessor who had a staff that was very knowledgeable in this area. So you have fresh blood in there. They probably looked at all the work they have to do. And they looked at this case and said, no, thanks. Um, this is not one I, that I want to take. Here's another difference that I'm in real time thinking about. Uh oh, Han this could be between, dangerous. Between Hanrahan uh, homicide and DeSaro homicide. Uh, well, first of all, DeSaro homicide was hindered by the fact that you had no body for Till 2016. Right, for you know 25 years. But you also had a situation with DeSaro where it was pretty clear in terms of motive and in terms of a specific group of people that wanted to get rid of him. With Hanrahan, although I feel like we, the insiders and the people that understand the inside baseball politics, we've probably come to a... a consensus of why Hanrahan was killed now that DeLuca has has um debriefed and, and shed some light into that. But if you if you're in front of a jury and you're a defense attorney worth his salt, Hanrahan had a dozen people that wanted him dead. There are a dozen different reasons why he could have been killed. And I think it speaks to why we didn't really know exactly why he was murdered until the last handful of years there was the i mean i had always my research until deluca uh told told us what we know now my, i was under the impression and i think a lot of other people were that the hanrahan murder had something to do with hanrahan uh extorting some some bookmakers bookmakers that belonged to salemi yeah. and that really it might have played a small role but now it looks like 
The reason Hanrahan was killed is that he was recruited. This is crazy to think if, if this is true, and I believe it is, that uh, uh, Raymond Jr. from uh, behind bars was upset with Frank Salemi uh, over the fact that Salemi had sold uh, his classic car collection because Salemi was upset that Patriarcha Jr. hadn't paid for his hospital bills in his assassination attempt in 89. Um, and Patriarcha Jr. from prison, according to DeLuca, hires Hanrahan to try to kill Salemi in, in, in Minocchio. Um, yeah, and some of that has come out. I mean, not, not the Jr. stuff, but some of the uh, details about the Hanrahan uh, as a hitman on Menachio and Salemi has come out in court filings. And I, I think the government was testing uh, some of that theory because you are right. Kevin Hanrahan had about as many enemies as anyone on this planet, if yeah. you will. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but he ran a lot in southeastern Massachusetts. So for your listeners not familiar with the area like Taunton, Fall mm -hmm. River, New Bedford. He's very close to Timmy the Bat Mello. Who, Timmy Mello, who's Paul, still Paul around. Guy, yeah. um, yep. And so all of that. Um, and, and he was close to he was close to Salemi. I mean, for a period of time, he was doing a lot of work for Salemi. I know that he was present um, at the at the altercation that came out in court uh, when uh, uh, Tommy Hillary, who was uh, Raymond L.S. Patriarch is kind of adopted surrogate son, uh, got thrown out of town by Frank Salemi for, for stealing. I know that Salemi had a whole kind of entourage with him. I think it was 90, 90 or 91 uh, at a Chinese restaurant um, in Plymouth, I think. Uh, and uh, Hanrahan was part of that entourage. So he was hanging with well, they were also, always rivals. Uh, yeah, we'll also think about where, um, so people mainly think about uh, Cadillac Frank is a Boston guy. He was actually from Sharon, Massachusetts, Massachusetts right. which is closer to the areas that we, we just described there. So I, I'm actually unfamiliar and fascinated with that Chinese food restaurant story. You just, <laughs> up. I don't, well, first we thought at first we thought it, was I don't in know that China that was in China. Well, it's, I've been able to glean, I got some documents and then from the transcripts of, of um, uh, Hillary's testimony uh, at first, I think it looked like it was in Chinatown, but then I saw another thing that claimed that it was in the suburbs. I think someone said it was in Plymouth. Uh, but, uh, that, you know, Tommy Hillary was working at the channel, the nightclub that the Salemis and DeSaro uh, owned and had swiped like $5,000 to give to a girlfriend to start a nail shop or fashion line. Uh, didn't sit well with Cadillac Frank and... He called him to the to the restaurant. He had a whole group of people there. Hanrahan was there. Bobby DeLuca was there. I believe Denny uh, Lapore, uh, Denny Lapore was there. Um, Harpo Garbadian was there, who also recently died. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tommy Tommy Hillary showed up, thinking that Tommy Hillary was going to go there to meet a guy to talk about a, a stolen uh, shipment of silk shirts. Salemi wanted to meet him there without knowing that Hillary didn't know that Salemi's crew was going to be there when he showed up and Hillary shows up and he sits down with the guy that he's um, negotiating the, the silk shirt deal with. And Frank gets up and says, I want to talk to you in another booth. And then the next thing, you know, Frank's got his hands around Hillary's neck uh, telling him, get the fuck out of town. If I see you, the next time I see you here, I'll kill you on the spot. Mm. Um, some of that came out in in the in court testimony. Then I got some other stuff that colored it up uh, in, in a document. But it was interesting to me that Frank Salemi was rolling with like ten guys, and one of them was Kevin Hanrahan, who he's alleged to have ordered um, murdered. And yeah, well, and which which again to I think what your original point is. Uh, brings up the problems with the case because yeah. you can, uh, is, to steal your words, any defense attorney worth their salt is going to point to all this other stuff and the relationship with like, why would he ever kill this guy? It's all bogus. And the one person that the the government is getting their information from, uh, you know, was convicted of is perjury. Is that to say the least? 
um, that, you know, who's cut some deals, by the way, uh, to, to get out of prison and to be relocated down to, to Florida, um, you know, that that's a, it's a problem for that case. So no, I don't think we're going to see, uh, to, to wrap up the hand right hand thing. I don't think we're ever going to see what would truly be, um, judicial closure on on that case but i think there's enough information floating around there for people in the orbit um and for the public to kind of get an understanding of of what happened um uh, b- behind the scenes and, and all of that in, in terms of desaro uh, i want to get your opinion I, i've come to the conclusion because i've been asking myself this since they, they dug up the body in 16 about both those guys had opportunities to get clear of that while they were in their initial debriefings. Meaning uh, DeLuca Bobby and, and, and Salemi. Yeah. Salemi. They're, they're, and called, they both, they're called proper sessions proper that you, session. that you give with day. the FBI. Yeah, yep. Queen for a day. Uh, and they both they, they both opted not to. At first, I said to myself, well, Salemi was protecting his son because his son was uh, the guy that actually killed allegedly, well, not allegedly, he's been convicted or the case well, has been adjudicated, yeah. allegedly strangled, or not allegedly, a strangled DeSaro to death in, in the Salemi family kitchen in front of his father and uncle, allegedly. Um, but then I realized uh, he was dead at that point. So I, what I've, what I've, in my head, what I've, how I've made sense of this is that Bobby DeLuca and Frank Salemi were so close that they both were protecting each other until they could no longer protect each other. That Salemi did not give up the DeSaro murder because A, he didn't want to give up um, Bobby, and B, he didn't want to give up his brother, Jackie. Maybe. You know, I don't know. I think particularly with Bobby, the motivation is almost certainly Joe. His brother, Uh, right. And Joe, uh, according to his own testimony, helped bury DeSaro's body off a of branch Ave, behind the mill building, as you said, like a half an hour ago, owned by Billy Ritchie, who got jammed up in a pot case. There we are. That's the full arc yep. in like 10 seconds. Um, and that he was protecting Joe. What, whether or not Salemi was protecting Bobby, and maybe that was an element too for Bobby protecting Salemi, I'm less likely to believe it with Bobby because at this point, you know, he's already cooperating with the government he's already he's in a proper session for a reason right mm-hmm. so let me less so that proper session was more about going about after whitey and, Folger and conley and Fleming taking them out that's what he wanted to do because they're traitors you know um i've talked to people who are like you know so let me never technically broke the oath of omerta by by doing that you could debate it whatever no he bobby, only testified against john conley he didn't testify against right but but I mean, even just figures. even just talking about it you know yeah. one might no, say, i but, believe he i believe he was a, a rat or a cooperator but in terms of what he did in court on the stand he didn't put away any lcm figures right bobby on the uh, flip side did right mm-hmm. he he literally down the road wore a wire for the mm-hmm. fbi and 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 all of that so I'm not so sure. There's no, the old phrase is there's no honor among thieves. And I'm, you might be right. Who knows? We can't, uh, Cadillac Frank is dead. Bobby's in the wind. Uh, we can't read their minds about their motivation. But I, I always think that uh, the most obvious answer is almost always the right one. And, and they're I just think lie. they're just, their, their DNA tells them to lie. So they lie. That's right. That's right. And particularly, it's one thing to talk about this case and that case uh, and who's in power, things like we're talking about a murder, an unsolved murder, yeah. who uh, Bobby connected Joe to Frank to pick up the body. Remember, Bobby was supposed to go and pick up the body uh, of Stephen DeSaro, yes. but it was Joe that went because Joe wanted to protect his brother in that right. case. So he and went. And it's, it. cr- it's also crazy to me, and it shows you what a cowboy Cadillac Frank was. This guy was the boss of the family and he's delivering a body. Well, the cowboy, in- or you could use another word. Like we're going back to Louis. He, he wouldn't have done that. You would never, Louis would be 20 people removed from something like that. That's Frank's right. actually putting a body in his trunk and taking it across state lines. But Hey, 
Frank was a hands-on boss. What yeah. can you say? Real blue collar, hardworking guy <laughs> where he, uh, I mean, it happened in his kitchen. It happened right. in his kitchen. And Did he want, I mean, he, 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 this type of guy that wanted to see it done. Uh, it seems to me, again, from talking to people, I talked to Frank himself. I didn't talk him about this murder, but um, that his son was a point of pride to him. Uh, his son being a tough guy was a point of pride to him. And he wanted to be there when his son strangled someone to death. Mm. As disturbing as that sounds. Um, I, I, I just on a anecdotal notion, I've been with criminals when they're with their sons and the, they're, it's so different than like when I'm with my father and my father's <laughs> bragging about me. my son, you know, had a book that, that uh, sold X amount or my son was on this television show. And then sometimes I, you know, contrast it with some, I'll be with some wise guys and their son and they'll be introducing me to their son and be like, my son beat up this guy at this place and he robbed this store at this place. Like he's bragging about him in a criminal, uh, the way the way that my father brags about me in my kind of journalistic endeavors in some ways it's not all that different is it yeah. if you think about it you well, know i've always described frank salami jr as exactly like his father without any of the charisma or likability <laughs> yeah the, the, i never met him i uh, you know i, I never, never met, met him. i mean i obviously never yeah. met him either i'm just from talking to people i met frank senior i never met frank yeah. jr um but uh i i just his, I've never, I haven't heard, I've talked to two dozen people that knew Frankie Boy, and not one of them had a positive thing to say about him, as opposed to Cadillac Frank, who, he was crazy, and he had his enemies, and he was Wild West cowboy um, mob guy, but there were people that were fiercely loyal to him, and, and loved him to the day he died. Yeah, he was always in the crosshairs. I mean, I guess I guess every boss is always in the crosshairs, but boy, it felt more like with Cadillac Frank, he was more in the crosshairs than most. Uh, and I think some of it is, you know, he did put his money where his mouth is in terms of he was a tough, scary guy uh, who, as I joked about, but it's it's true, was very very hands on um, and very ambitious. Yes, very ambitious and. It feels like ancient history, but it wasn't too long ago. I mean, the 1990s and the crime family was still humming along at that at that time. So he took the reins of the crime family uh, after Junior at a, a really tumultuous time, yes, to say the least. And there was a lot of a lot of infighting there, and there were always rumors that New York would take over uh, New England at that time, and there was a push from Springfield uh, because. I, I'm sure you, most of your listeners know, but Springfield's actually controlled by New York. It's not yeah. controlled. The Genovese outfit as opposed that's right. to a patriarch outfit. Th that's right. But that also harkens back to the uh, the patriarchal crime family's ties to the Genovese uh, crime family and the respect, loyalty, whatever word you want to use there uh, uh, between those two. But who knows? There could be an expiration date uh, on that. I mean, technically, if going back to an another conversation we had, uh, technically, if something happens to Eddie and uh, there's a new underboss that comes up, you know, New York is usually involved in, in something like that. But who knows with the state of affairs now, we know uh, partic the Sorry. particularly if the intelligence you have is true about some of the, uh, the way some, they open the books within the past year or so. I mean, who knows? Then times have changed. We definitely know from court records and debriefings and so forth that, uh, surveillance um audio uh recordings that cadillac frank needed the support of the gambinos to solidify his regime um in right. in new england he had um big chris uh, ricicci come to town um who was one of john Gotti's guys and they wind and dined him in the north end uh they met him at the the hilton, the, the hilton hotel by the airport by the airport and bugged the bugged the meeting Yep, that's right. That was uh, I was in court for the testimony of the uh, I think it was the FBI agent who was on in the other room next door, bugging that whole thing. But that look to your point, that was a big deal uh, in, in that time for for Cadillac Frank, um, and sort of legitimized him and his power 
to have someone like that uh, sent sent by the Gambinos to come up. Uh, but it's still a Genovese um, connection, I would say. Again, all lagging indicators, things can change uh, at any time. But uh, for him, there was a there was a, a view at that time that the the New England crime family was at a real weak point um, when the transition was happening from Junior to Salemi. And uh, if there's a vacuum, someone's going to fill it. Uh, so uh, that was, I guess, a testament to Cadillac Frank Salemi that he was able to hold on to power. He didn't hold on to power for all that long, uh, but he was able to uh, take control. Um, it's pretty interesting. It seems to be that there was a, it seems to me that there was a miscalculation um, in 84 when El, Raymond L.S. Patriot died. died. Uh, he hadn't, from what I can understand, he hadn't really named a successor. Uh, Raymond so. Jr. kind of threw his hat into the ring and the New York guys got behind him because he was L.S.'s. Yo, that was a total awesome. respect. It, yeah, 100%. And was, they didn't yeah, really respect. do the math that this guy isn't equipped um, for this position and it quickly played out that way. Uh, and I want to point out also in that disharmony that was going on in, in 89 with Cadillac Frank almost getting killed um, and a war almost breaking out that according again to uh, FBI records and, and documents, surveillance uh, reports, there was a wedding uh, Labor Day 89, I believe. Um, in Long Island, I think, that uh, uh, a uh, contingent of Boston guys went to, led by Vinnie Ferrara and Joe Russo, where Gotti was there and called them into a, a meeting in a back room and told them, make peace. And that that was one of the reasons that led to the... Um, well, Joe Russo was... Making in in the next Medford week. and Joe Russo, uh, was he the consigliere at the time? Yeah. Um, yes. And so, then they had, there was some type of get together um, in in Maverick Square in late August, where the whole where the Providence guys and the Boston guys all came together as like a a show of good faith. Um, it, it, I had heard it was for Joe Russo's birthday, but then I looked and it didn't make sense. His birthday wasn't around that time, but. Uh, Cadillac Frank did not go. I think he was in exile at that point. But well, he wasn't. He was also not at that ceremony, right? Uh, in Medford, Massachusetts, and right. I think that's significant, right? Yes. Because you had some people at that ceremony that tried to kill him. Yes. Um. And so, you know, yeah, Gotti, I guess, wanted to make peace, but more than Gotti wanted to make peace, Raymond Raymond Jr. wanted yeah. to make peace because I think. Uh, he was really, really concerned that he was next because yeah. you say there, there was almost a war. I don't know, Scott. I think there was, I mean, a, was war. a war. Yeah, there was a war. Yeah. And, and I a, mean, the guy a... in, in Connecticut who was killed, I'm drawing a blank on his name. Um, you're better with names than I am, but uh, he was killed in the same. Oh, I mean, uh, Billy Grasso. The, Billy Grasso. Thank the under, you. The underboss. Grasso was, was snuffed out. The same, same day, day, same day. It was a coordinated so let me go, go is yeah. you know gunned down outside a, a pancake place in Saugus, Massachusetts. You know, I mean, this was this it was happening at that time, and and there's Raymond Jr. looking around him, going, "Oh my gosh, you know, I, I could be next." So I, I don't think anyone was happier to do a a, a ceremony where the, the the Joey Russos of the world wanted this person made and then bobby was that was when bobby was inducted which is, which is interesting another thing i found in some old documents recently was i had already i had always assumed and this is the problem with you shouldn't have assumed that salemi had salemi and raymond jr had put bobby deluca up for his button that's not the case jr russo and vinnie ferrara put bobby up for his button because of all the work Bobby did during the war, even though he wasn't a made guy, he was a conduit between both of those sides. He got along with Ferrara and Russo from some previous dealings, um, and then was acting as a uh, as a mouth, mouthpiece liaison for for uh, Patriarca Junior. And then when things had settled down, 
Russo and Ferrara put up DeLuca for his butt. Yeah, DeLuca had really strong ties to the Massachusetts faction of the organized crime, as you point out, even before he got his button in, 19, in 1989. Um, and that continued when Salemi took over. I mean, Salemi and DeLuca are real We're tight. Super close, yeah. Really tight. And actually, Bobby broke up a fight in prison um, between Salemi and uh, I forget who it was, but it was when the big indictments all came down in 1994 and all and that. Yeah. And he um, was a, he, uh, it, it, it was one of the Boulder guys. Yeah, it was someone from that faction. And yeah. Salemi was going to kill him. You know, yeah. they were all, in, I don't know why they were all together in the same holding cell, but uh, I think it was because they were, because DeLuca was in the case with Salemi yes. in, in the 94. So they were in a, um, like a defense, uh, they were co defendants. So they were allowed to meet to discuss the case. Yeah. But anyway, so DeLuca stepped in, had, Salemi's back, all of that. So um, he he goes he goes way back. But I think on the flip side, <clears throat> there was always a little bit of distrust in Providence of Bobby DeLuca from guys like Anthony the Saint Saint Laurent, who was a well, they, capo. Hate, they hated each other. They hated each other. Um, and Anthony, you know, he handled Rhode Island, but he had a big chunk of that area uh, where Kevin Hanrahan ran in Southeast, Southeast Mass, yeah. Taunton, you know, Fall River, all that. Um, and he really distrusted Bobby DeLuca, obviously, for, as we know now, good, good reason. I mean, uh, and, uh, and but that relationship that that Bobby had with Massachusetts, I think, sort of played into Anthony's disdain for Bobby. And there were others like that that didn't really that didn't really trust. It's, him, it's so. interesting, though, that they sent Bobby on the night of Grasso's murder and the assassination attempt on Salemi. Uh, all the made guys. Uh, Matty, Agugliametti, the Saint, um, Raymond Jr. all gathered at uh, the Saint's house, and they called Bobby and they said, "Bobby, go to the North End and go talk to uh, Vinny and, and and Jr. and see if this came from them." And he, he didn't even have a button. <laughs> uh, no, as, thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> as, as we're as we're wrapping up here, I just want to yeah. um, throw one more thing at you to get your uh, opinion on of some opinion on my reporting not just my reporting but also on um some some documentation from the state police in massachusetts uh it appears that Vinny the animal ferrara who was a major figure in in the war and all the unrest in in the 80s was a younger guy at that point college educated has a business degree from boston college uh, has was mentored by the Angelo brothers, specifically Danny Angelo, um, and then was very close to J.R. Russo. Did uh, about 15 years in prison. He was doing life on a, uh, a, a murder that eventually got tossed. It was actually a close friend of his named Jimmy Lamoli. He was murdered in 1985 in, um, in the North End. Comes out of prison in 05, 06. Everything I've been hearing is that he was pretty much retired, um, owns a lot of property, very rich from the, uh, the illegitimate means, a lot of uh, parking garages in the North End, I've heard. Um, but then there was a case uh, about 10 years ago that he got caught, looked like he was bookmaking a little bit. And then in the last year, year and a half, it, it's come out in court filings that he is the target of a Massachusetts State Police racketeering investigation. My reporting is that whether it be the Denunzio brothers or someone else in the, the admin um, has given Frank, or not Frank, has given Vinny uh, Norfolk County um, in Massachusetts and that he's in charge of it in some capacity and that he acts in some pseudo conciliary um, role. I know that the feds confiscated about a quarter million dollars, not the feds, the state police confiscated about a quarter million dollars from a bank account that they claim uh, was ill-gotten gain, illegal, uh, legally, um, illegal funds that were in that bank account. Uh, do you have any opinions or, or, or takes on where Vinny the Animal it stands today in, the, in 2023? I don't, and I don't because I haven't done the re reporting on it that you have. Again, got my hands full in Rhode Island. Yeah. I'm familiar with what you're talking about, but only as someone who's sort of consumed what you've put out there. Um, 
but I mean, his surname is one of the most infamous in yep. all of the New England crime family. And uh, I think it goes back to what you pointed out, rightfully so, earlier in our discussion, which is sort of a unique thing in New England that you have state police in both Rhode Island and Massachusetts doing these types of cases. And they just have that institutional knowledge um, more so than I would say than the Fed sometimes do with these kind of players and can bring these kinds of cases. So I'm more fascinated as sort of a consumer of it than as uh, someone investigating it myself from a journalistic standpoint. Yeah. Um, but do me a favor, Scott, if you hear any of it overlap into, into my world. I'll give you a text. Give me a text. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tim, this was awesome, man. Thank you so much for joining me. People like yourself make this type of podcast possible because, you know, the knowledge that you bring, the insight that you bring, uh, it's invaluable. And uh, thank you so much. Scott, it was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hopefully we'll, uh, you know, Tim came on uh, the audio uh, version uh, before we went to video a year or two ago. So maybe we'll, we'll make this a yearly uh, Let's do update. it. I'm in. Uh, we'll, we'll see you in 2024 for another Patriarch of Family Update. Thank you, Tim. Benny behind the glass. Uh, and everybody out there in OG Podland, I'm Scott Burns. I'll see you next week. I'm out. Mm -hmm.